As tensions rise in Ghana's parliament, the political landscape is witnessing a significant power struggle over the status of four MPs which could shift the balance of power between the majority and the minority. At the heart of the controversy is the invocation of Article 97 of the 1992 Constitution, which calls for MPs who change their party affiliation or contest as independence to vacate their seats. Now, this issue has sparked heated debate with the opposition NDC arguing that these MP seats must be declared vacant, potentially allowing them to secure a majority in Parliament, like we've seen. With the latest Supreme Court ruling suspending indefinitely the Speaker's decision to declare the seats vacant, we ask, what's next? I'm Kevin Yamano and this is Hot Issues. In this episode, we explore the constitutional, political and electoral ramifications of this ruling, which will likely create a parliamentary standoff. My guest and I will unpack the stakes and discuss what this means for governance in the lead up to the 2024 elections. My guest is former Deputy Attorney General and Bogotanga East MP, Dr. Dominic Ayene. Doc, you're welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you very much for having me, Kemeni. Where will your side sit on Tuesday when you reconvene? Well, um, ordinarily, um, we should have been sitting, we should be sitting at the majority side um, because from the Speaker's ruling, we have 136 members and the New Patriotic Party has 135 members. So they are in the minority. But of course, the orders of the Supreme Court will have to be implemented. I don't know how long it's going to take for Mr. Speaker to implement it. If he's implementing the orders from day one, then it means that uh, we revert to the position in which we were, which means that we will not move to the majority side. But if he's not implementing it on Tuesday, mm -hmm. then we will you know, be on the majority side until such a time that he announces that he has uh, started the implementation. Because I believe Mr. Speaker is going to instruct his lawyers um, to as a matter of agency, you know, file um, processes on Monday to try to set aside the orders of the Supreme Court. Mm. I, I think that that is what is going to happen. Are we... I, I, I spoke to, I spoke to uh, Mr. Speaker's lawyer, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Tadio Sori, before I came to the studio, right. you know, when I knew that we were going to be discussing some of these issues. So definitely, I believe that Mr. Speaker's, um, you know, instructions will include um, expeditious filing mm. on Monday to be able to contest the orders that have been uh, made by the Supreme Court. Because mm. as I said, ex parte orders are an aberration, especially when they are being issued against another branch of government, and mm. es especially a co-equal branch of government. The courtesy should have been extended to Mr. Speaker mm -hmm. so that his lawyers will come to court to contest the injunction application on his merits. Mm. All right? Now, Mr. Speaker has, you know, performed a public function you know, by informing the House, pursuant to Order 18 of the Standing Orders of, of, of Parliament, of the occurrence of a vacancy, mm -hmm. right? And there are public duties flowing from that, that, you know, will, will ensue from, from Tuesday. Now, to yeah. enjoin the performance of those public duties, you know, is unusual. I mean, the courts have been very, very clear that you don't enjoin the performance of a public, you know, duty. But of course, I think... The lawyers for the Honorable Afeo Markin mm. uh, basically use the specter mm. of uh, deprivation of representation, you know, as the basis. As if, I see. As if, as if in 2020, when they decided to write for the Formula, Formula MP, situation. you know, to not to, not to I mean, uh, um, be recognized in Parliament, the people of Formina were not, were they not deprived of mm. representation? Of mm. course, I mean... Is it, does that, that sound, hip, you know, hypocritic well, for you? Yeah, it, it is. It is very, I mean, they are exhibiting double standards, all right? I mean, and that's typical of the MPP. Part of the problems we have had in this country, you know, with our democracy, is what I call the MPP exceptionalism. They always want to be an exception. So they were the ones who engineered the, I mean, the processes leading to the um, removal if I may say so, or the, the declaration of a vacancy, the occurrence of a vacancy as far as Formina 
was concerned. Mm. And then today they turn around and say, no, 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 no. Yes, we did it in the, we did it in the past, but it was wrong. I mean, the snippets of the Supreme Court ruling that you have heard, do you also get the impression it would appear as though they had ruled on the substantive case instead of you I, I, ruling on an expert? You are spot on. I, I, I think um, they sounded to me, and I, again, I must enter the caveat that I haven't read, you know, the, the ruling in its, and I mean, uh, fully. Okay, what I am commenting on is based upon journalistic accounts mm -hmm. that are on social and mainstream media. Uh, but they sound to me like final orders. You know, for instance, to say um, the, the ruling of the speaker uh, will deprive them of representation means you are, just, you are simply saying that what Mr. Speaker has done, all right, you know, undercuts the concept or practice of representation, I mean, uh, contemplated under the Constitution. And that's why I said earlier that the, the, the deprivation of representation is contemplated under Article 90, I mean, 97. Mm -hmm. And it is not a constitutional anomaly, anomaly right? So, for instance, um, if I write to resign today, okay, three months to an election, the people of Bulga East, you know, will be deprived of representation. But it is something that is contemplated under Article, I mean, 97 of the mm. Constitution. Would you then right? say that the Supreme Court was wrong in its decision? I, I, I mean, I need to read it before, but I think that they, I think that they are wrong. If you use the concept of representation as the basis to say that not even for one day should somebody be not represented in parliament, even when they have conducted themselves in a way that violates the constitution of the Republic of Ghana, right? Um, then I think that that is wrong. Because, for instance, if you take Cynthia Morrison, I'm just giving her as an example. I'm not saying, you know, she's declared herself an independent candidate. She has proceeded to the Electoral Commission to file um, her nomination as an independent candidate. She's in the constituency, as we speak, campaigning against the new patriotic party. Okay? Then she comes to parliament, and you say it is okay. She can go and sit on the side of the new patriotic party and then pretend that she's legitimately a member of the new patriotic party. That gives them a majority over the, the NDC, mm -hmm. right? Because under the MPP's own constitution, particularly, I mean, specifically Article 3, immediately you file as an independent, you lose your membership of the party. It's automatic. Mm -hmm. So Cynthia Morrison, the Honorable Cynthia Morrison, she's my colleague and friend, is no longer a member of the New Patriotic Party. What business does she have sitting on that side and voting with them? Mm. And then in your case, you in, have the Amenfi Central? The same, I mean, it, well, I, I mean, uh, Amenfi Central. Yes. He is in the constituency campaigning against our, our candidate. The NDC's candidate for Amenfi Central is, um, you know, Joanna Jan, uh, Joanna Jan Kujo. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Honorable Aka is in the constituency campaigning against our candidate. And then we, you say that it is okay for him to come and join our side and then, you know, I mean, uh, uh, say that he's a legitimate me member of the party and he's, you know, working with us it in sounds parliament. Like, sounds like this ruling is going to create chaotic scenes in parliament for the next two months, if it stays. Well, it will not create, it will not have created any, you mean the ruling of the, the Supreme ruling Court? The ruling of the Supreme of course, Court. I mean, it, it, is, it is going to, it is going to, as I said, I keep saying, it's going to take us back, you know, one step back from where we came from, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm hoping that eventually, you know, the dust will settle mm -hmm. and we will know where the constitution Because now, now you are having to, your side in parliament would have to put up with, you know, a person who is, like you said, is campaigning against your, yeah. uh, your candidate in Amenfi Central. Right. Even the NPP side will also have to contend with three people who have said they are parting ways yeah. uh, with, with the party. Very uncomfortable situation. Can the business of parliament go on with the, in, 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 the, in the center of the scenario? No, it's because, uh, Kemini, we, we um, conduct politics of convenience and not politics of principle. And that is, that is where, you know, that is what is driving us into this type of crisis. Okay, because if we were conducting politics of principle, okay, um, we should not be entertaining the, the, the MPs that you have named mm -hmm. within our midst. Because in principle, they have quit, you know, their I mean, uh, positions as members of the respective parties by filing to run as independents, all right? And also, 
um, you know, the, in, the, in the case of the um, second deputy speaker, mm -hmm. uh, another very good friend of mine, okay, um, he has decided to join the new patriotic party. So he's no longer an independent. So if we're conducting, I mean, uh, uh, politics according to principle, mm -hmm. you know, they should not be coming to parliament. The MPP should have accepted that vacancies have occurred, the balance of power in parliament has shifted, mm -hmm. and then um, all of us would have been happy, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 working with each other mm. to conduct the business of state, you know, and then for parliament to be dissolved on the, you know, I mean, uh, 6th of January, and for the fifth parliament, you know, I mean, the ninth parliament to, to be ushered in. I see. Well, I mean, will it be your expectation and perhaps even advice that these four people whose seats have been in contention perhaps should resign for the sanity of parliament itself? Well, the question of, re, re, I mean, resignation is left to the individual MP, all right? Um, they cannot be compelled to resign, um, you know. So, for me, yes, but if, if I were in their situation, I would, I would have resigned because that is, that is what the Constitution actually expects of me, right? If I am independent and I decide to join another party, I'm no longer qualified to describe myself as an independent. So I would have written a letter resigning so mm -hmm. that I can contest, contest on the ticket of a political party. Again, if um, I, mean, I am uh, in parliament as the, the candidate, I mean, as the MP mm -hmm. of a political party, and I decide that I have differences, deep-seated differences with that political party, as is the case with, uh, you, know, um, you know, the Honorable Aka, whose case I know really very well because I have been very much involved in trying to uh, resolve, uh, I mean, uh, the, the ampas in Amenfi Central, mm -hmm. okay? Um, if, if I were in his case, the, the differences between him and our party are deep-seated. Deep they are irresolvable differences. We have tried to persuade him you know, to back off, and he, he's not backing off. If I were him, in good conscience, I would have tendered my resignation as an, a member of parliament and then gone on to, I mean, contest as an independent. If the Supreme Court ruling is an interference in the work of parliament, should the Speaker abide by this? Should the Speaker adhere to the order from the Supreme Court? Yes, he should. The reason is simply because even if a court order is wrong, it must be obeyed. Unfortunately, that is the position of the law. Won't that set a bad precedent? Um, no, it will not set a bad precedent because it is, it is anticipated that the person affected by the wrong order will have, an, I, mean, I mean, his or her day in court to set that order aside. So disobey, dis, I mean, uh, uh, disobeying the court order is not an option. And as a lawyer, I always advise my client clients that it, though the order may be you know, unpleasant, uh, you may think that the court is wrong and so on. Please obey it until we have been able to bring that to the notice I mean, of the court that it was wrong and then have the order set aside. I mean, practically, on Tuesday, uh, assuming that the, uh, you know, the NPP side decides to no longer boycott the activities of parliament, comes to the House, do you envisage how chaotic it's going to be? Because I assume they'll go to the majority <laughs> side of the speaker. I, 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 pre, I presume they would because that is what they've been, I mean, uh, um, saying all along. And I think they have been emboldened, you know, by the ruling of the Supreme Court and the orders ensuing from that ruling. And I'm sure they will be, seated, they will be going back to the major, majority side of the house. And what will your side do? Where will your side sit? To the minority side? Well, I'm sure if we are early, we can go to the majority side to sit until Mr. Speaker orders otherwise. <laughs> but it, it is chaotic. It spells a very chaotic scene come Tuesday. Yeah, it does. And, it, it does. And is that helpful to parliamentary well, business, it, it, to it's, the nation? It's not, it's not very helpful. But as I said you know, uh, before, all right, if we were conducting ourselves according to the principles and values of the Constitution, the chaos would have, was, I mean, would have been avoided. But we are not doing so. We are basically conducting the politics of, of you know, convenience. And that is, what, that is what is creating the problem. Do you think that there are issues that would be considered urgent uh, and, you know, the Supreme Court hasn't called, you know, hasn't come to that decision to call some of these 
you know, cases that have been described mm -hmm. as urgent, uh, to think that in the case of the SAL situation, the Supreme Court didn't make the argument of representation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, but in this case, here we are, a case of representation is being made. Yeah. For you as a lawyer, what interpretation do you make into well, all of it, that? It is, it is very sad. It is very sad. Um, I didn't want to cite the SAL situation, you know, um, for obvious reasons, you know, because sometimes when you comment on matters that are pending before the court, they tend to think that as a lawyer you should not be doing so. But you see the comparisons, you know, are very stark, right? Where by an administrative fiat, the Electoral Commission, okay, uh, basically deprived the people of SAL of representation by a simple letter. And for four years, they are in court, you know, going up and down the court, you know, I mean, hierarchy, you know, to deal with this matter. And nobody thinks that the people of SAL, you know, deserve to be represented urgently. All of a sudden, the people of, I mean, Fee Central, the people of Gomoy, I mean, uh, West, uh, the people of Omina are more important than the people of SAL in terms of representation. I mean, that is very telling, mm. all right? Sometimes it gives the impression that when the MPP wants something done, the, the Supreme Court gives it to them. And that is not good for the image of the court. Honestly speaking, I mean, these contrasts, these developments, you know, tell us, I mean, they, there is, I mean they, they, they provide the basis of a certain narrative and a deep-seated perception, you know, of, I mean, on, on even handedness when it comes to, you know, the actions and decisions of the courts. And, and that is not good, you know, for the neutrality and independence of the judiciary in a democracy. It is not. Mm, I see. Uh, Doc, we'll take a break. When we come back, we would ask the question, what at all could you have done with b being the majority side uh, in parliament? For which reason, you know, you're crying so much. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. My guest is former Deputy Attorney General Bogatanga East MP, Dr. Dominic Ayene Doc. Thank you so much for your patience and, and sitting with us. You know, the question then would be that, listen, what at all could you have done in less than two months for, you know, this uh, parliament to expire so much that you want to hold on to being majority? Well, um, we didn't want to hold on to being a majority. It was handed right? to you. It was, it was handed, handed, handed over to us uh, by the occurrence of vacancies, the natural occurrence of vac vacancies, you know, in the, in the house. Um, so, the, the, but there's a lot that we could have done, right? Um, for instance, there are a number of obnoxious tax measures that we have proposed in the past that we think should not be on the statute books. Okay, so like the COVID levy, okay. uh, for instance, the e-levy, we have always been opposed to it. You know, we worked out, you know, we have also promised, for instance, you know, to uh, repeal the, I mean, uh, the 10% tax on betting, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, uh, earnings and so on. Right. Okay, so if the, um, the um, Supreme Court ruling had not, in, I mean, intervened, um, we would have taken steps, mm -hmm. you know, to repeal all these taxes, and uh, Ghanaians would have benefited from them um, within the period that we are talking about. But of course, the, the caveat here is that Mr. President would have had to sign any bill that is things. enacted for their repeal. Mm. And I can bet, you know, with uh, I mean, uh, all the, the, the um, I don't know what, what to say, all the money that I have that Mr. President would not Wouldn't. have signed them. Which would have created a stalemate. It would have created a stalemate. But even, even before the president could do that, perhaps your majority will only be in theory. Because 108, Article 108 also tells us that you cannot uh, you know, impose tax or alter yeah. taxation. Yeah. Otherwise, then, all By you can reduction. do is reduce. Yes. Right? So when we repeal, so let's say the tax is 10%. Uh -huh. When we repeal, it's zero. You will reduce it to zero. Yeah, we reduce it to zero. Which is what you are allowed to do yeah, under one one way. Because you, you, you can't do any alterations. No, we can't do any alterations. Except by a downward adjustment of the tax. So uh -huh. if we, we bring, you know, let's say 
for betting, right? It is 10%, and we mm -hmm. say that the tax shall now be zero, you know, percent, right? That is that is a downward adjustment. That 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 is not removing the the bill, but you're just bringing. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. So, sounds really smart, doesn't yes, it? it, it does. I, I wonder what you know other legal minds make of that. You know, well, the fact. So, so what, what would you have done with it? What what kinds of uh, uh, bills would you have been oh, able no, to? Certainly, repeat? I believe. I mean, strategically, would have would have would have uh, um, you know focus on the on the taxes because they affect the household economy. Mm -hmm. You know, of 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 the citizens. They affect you know the commercial sector. You know, of of our country. For instance, importers, you know, pay the the COVID levy mm -hmm. when they import uh, goods into the country, and the the price of those goods are affected by, I mean, uh, the the COVID levy. Um, if you, for instance, want to you want to transfer anything in excess of twenty thousand from your the the app of your you know, I mean, your 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 bank, mm -hmm. right? You want to transfer twenty, I mean, uh, let's say twenty five thousand Ghana cities. You'll be paying 250 cities in, I mean, an e-levy. And all you right? would have dealt with all yeah, that. You would have dealt with all of that. Hmm, okay, I see. so, yes. Yeah, but, I mean, but, this would have been... I mean, but if, if a hung parliament didn't really serve the Ghanaian people as much as we thought it would, uh, I mean, a majority for two months until January 7th, midnight, you're sure that these things could have dealt with a lot of the issues? Because you would do no. it, but will the executive apply it? So maybe perhaps, in theory... This whole thing well, would have just been on paper. Well, yeah, I mean, they, um, you are right about that. I mean, I can't, I can't see the executive enforcing, you know, measures that we have, uh, measures that we have uh, adopted, you know, I mean, uh, by, as a, uh, I mean, a one-sided house, okay? But I, I do think, I do think that we have been communicating to the, the people of this country Okay, what intentions we have mm -hmm. for them when we, we resume the reins of government in uh, January 2025. Mm, I see. Uh, but now you do not have that opportunity. Uh, we do not know the action that the speaker will be taking right. once, you know, this, uh, you, you, you reconvene on Tuesday. On Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, my worry is where it, all of this leaves the Ghanaian people if parliamentary business does not go on. I think, you know, to be, to, be, to be honest with you, parliamentary business will go on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that um, we, will, we will certainly stall a lot of parliamentary business as a result of the, reconfig I mean, the reconfiguration, mm -hmm. you know, of the House on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. All right. There are those who have said <coughs> that we should start to review the aspect of the Constitution on this matter and make it clearer. Which one? Uh, uh, you know, uh, on Article 97, on how... Right. Well, because they say that... Uh -huh. I, I mean, if you have read uh, Professor Kweku Asari's uh, statement, yes. it would appear that he makes the argument that uh, what is written in the Constitution does not apply to the current parliament. It's too, it, it takes a, a future look at I, the, I, I disagree the person in question. I disagree vehemently with him. Um, the... the, the <clears throat> You know, the scenarios that he has uh, painted, right, and especially, you know, the, um, the bit about the futuristic application mm -hmm. of 97, all right, are not founded on any, on the text of the Constitution, right? It, it, they are not founded on the text of the Constitution. How so? Be so, for instance, I went back to the, the report of the Committee of Experts on the 1992 Constitution. All right, to see whether or not I can find any assistance with respect to the intention of the drafters of the constitution when it came to the issue of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, uh, let me say the, the issues raised, especially in Article 90, I mean, uh, um, 97, G and H. All right, so I, I went back to the report of the, the Committee of Experts and I, I tried to find out if they said anything mm -hmm. close to what Professor Kukwa, I mean, uh, Kukwaza, and then, I mean, Professor Sari, you know, always, yeah. I mean, often known as, uh, referred to as Kukwaza, you know, on social media. And then um, I think Professor Jampo also wrote extensively about the fact that this was to curb the situation that prevailed in 19, I think, uh, 58 or something, mm -hmm. 
um, in a, where, according to them, you know, the CPP was threatening the, um, was threatening the, uh, I mean, the Northern People's Party MPs to the extent that they all became frightened and started jumping ship to become members of the CPP. And he cited, you know, I mean, the, the late father of the current vice president, um, you know, I mean, uh, um, you know, Baumia, the late mm -hmm. Baumia, mm -hmm. as one of those uh, MPs. Now, I don't find support, you know, I mean, for that position in the text of the constitution and also in the report of the Committee of Experts. All right. And I also think that they are wrong in the sense that, you see, the... Um, there must be consequences, right. instantaneous consequences for the actions that people take. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you say, like, I gave the example of, uh, I mean, a, a person like Honorable Cynthia, I mean, um, uh, Morrison, who is um, um, now in her constituency in Agona West, campaigning. All right, campaigning against the MPP. And yet you say that should not have any constitutional consequences because the, cons the constitution contemplates a futuristic uh, you know, application of 97 to her, mm. if she wins as an independent and comes in and says she now wants to be, mm. um, I mean, the, um, I mean, a member of parliament for the, on the side of the MPP, then that is where you can say that she, I mean, she's caught by 97. But what is the difference factually between those two scenarios? Mm. Today, she's an MPP member who says, no, I am no longer your member because I have gone to file to run as an independent. And I have declared to the Electoral Commission that I am an independent candidate for this election. Despite being, I mean, having come to Parliament on the ticket of the, the new patriotic party. And you say that there should be no legal consequences flowing from that conduct. All right. But that we should wait, you know, for her to misconduct herself in the future. That is, that is, oh, that oh. is a paradox. You know? I I see. Yeah. I see. But, but, you know, one of the things, too, they appear to say is you know, why now in terms of, uh, you know, the Electoral Commission is printing notice of poll, perhaps we'll even go ahead to print notice of ballot and, I mean, ballot papers and yeah. it will appear that uh, it is now that Parliament wants to take cognizance of those uh, four MPs. Uh, and, and, and what could be the appropriate time? Under what circumstances could that immediately kick in, uh, you know, in terms of time frame? Well, in terms of time frame, I think this, the speaker got it right. At the point where you, you file and your, your nominations have been accepted, the notice of poll is printed only when your, your papers have been vetted mm -hmm. and you are qualified to run either on the ticket of a party or as, as an independent. And that's a public document. At that point in time, okay, you can then say that the person has committed the act contemplated under 97G, or 97, Article 97, GH of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. What happens, and perhaps I may have you know, asked you that in our earlier conversation, but what happens if Speaker or Parliament does not adhere to this uh, ruling from the Supreme Court? Well, if he does not adhere to the ruling, then it means that the ruling applies and we will continue to be the majority in Parliament. Mm, I That's see. what it means, yes. I see. Yes. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, Tuesday is just well, around the corner. I, I know, but knowing Mr. Speaker and uh, the fact that, you know, he's a very I mean, a respected lawyer in this country, I do not think that he would disobey he, the he Supreme would Court. He, I, I don't think so, and I don't mm, hope so. Mm. I think for whatever it is worth, he should obey the court. He should let his lawyers, lawyers file on Monday to contest the orders of the court. Uh, but if by Tuesday... The, the, the court has not said anything about, I mean, uh, I mean the outcome of his, uh, you know, opposition, mm. then he will have to obey the orders of the court for us to continue. Indeed. You mentioned you are Memphis Central, uh, you know, parliamentary, parliamentary candidates right. earlier, as yeah. against the, uh, you know, the current MP who is going independent, one of the four people right. uh, in this uh, scenario that has been created <clears throat> in the country in the last uh, few days. Yeah. Um, the Electoral Commission disqualified your PC in yeah. Amenfi Central, citing an injunction against her, you know, her primary. Right. Your party has vehemently, you, you know, denied that that injunction, injunction mm -hmm. should take effect now. Right. Legally, 
demystify this whole thing for us, honestly. <laughs> I, I don't know what mystery is, uh, you know, my, what mi mystery surrounds uh, the facts that you've narrated. But for instance, you see, um, the, the, the dispute in the second day high court um, emanates from, you know, a, I mean, a, a suit that was filed by a number of, uh, you know, persons who allege that our parliamentary candidate, um, you know, um, Joanna Jan Kujo, had committed fraud, all right? And when they made those allegations and, you know, filed their, um, you know, their processes in court, all right, the court made, you know, and they had an, I mean, they had an application for injunction. And the court, you know, ordered that she should be restrained from, you know, I mean, a court, um, holding herself out um, or being allowed to hold herself out as the MP, I mean, as the parliamentary candidate for Memphis Central. Okay. Now, our party took a cue from that um, because it flew, it, I mean, it flowed from the, the organization of our parliamentary primaries in that constituency. So our party then said, okay, we are nullifying the primaries, all right? So we are calling a new, I mean, a primaries, we are organizing a new primary, and then that will uh, be the basis for the selection of a candidate. So the party went ahead and organized a second primary, okay? And in those primaries, okay, the current MP, um, uh, the Honorable Aka, was disqualified, all right, I don't want to go into the merits mm -hmm. of his disqualification and so on. Um, but then, um, Joanna, Joanna Jan Kujo was elected, okay, um, as the parliamentary candidate uh, once again, all right. So, the reason why we are, we are saying that the injunction, the dif disqualification has no basis is because the first primaries mm -hmm. were nullified. The party that organized the primary said, okay, fine. We are nullifying those primaries. They will be treated as if they do not, no longer exist, right? And you cannot put something on nothing and expect it to stand. And so you cannot found a, an injunctive order, right, on non-existent, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, facts mm. or non-existent uh, non situation because the primaries were nullified. Well, but, but there are those who say that perhaps lawyer for uh, the parliamentary candidate should have filed to... Stay set aside. Yes. Yes. You know, vacate I mean, that rule. Well, okay. Maybe he didn't bring that to the attention of the, I mean, of the court. So it is assumed that that is still, you know, I mean, uh, uh, pending. But a nullity is a nullity. I mean, the court by itself can take judicial notice of developments in Amenfi I Central and say that, look, the primaries have been nullified. There's no basis for us to continue litigating this matter. Oh, so yeah. then the lawyer should have dotted his I's and crossed his T's to ensure that this matter will not come back to bite his client. So he dropped the ball on his client and not think, the electoral I don't commission. Think, I don't think he dropped the ball. And uh, that is why he has, I mean, he's contesting, you know, the disqualification in a in, fresh suit, indeed. you know, before the Accra uh, High Court. Absolutely. Yeah. Your party then says that the electoral commission is colluding with the, uh, you know, the governing party, NPP, uh, to ensure that they deliver Amefi Central on the silver platter for uh, the NPP. Right. But uh, is, is that what the, it, it is? Or perhaps the, the, the really is well, meaning I for mean, this? Well, I think it is also arising out of the fact that you are disqualifying her based upon an injunction. All right? You disqualify a person based upon a judgment on the merits that the person has not, has not been, I mean, uh, does not qualify to run. Okay, an injunction merely says you cannot, I mean, uh, hold yourself out. You are restrained from doing this A, B, and C until we have pronounced on the merits. Mm -hmm. So the Electoral Commission should not have gone ahead, you know, to, I mean, uh, to disqualify her. And then again, they went, they did the disqualification. They issued a letter supposedly disqualifying her. Then they went back and was now searching. Okay, they filed a search in the, I mean, in the court, trying to find out, ascertain the occurrence of certain facts that they, they ought to have known before, you know, the, the disqualification letter was issued. Right. I think that that is why, I mean, uh, the, the, um, I mean the party is putting, mm. I mean, uh, uh, one and one together and saying, look, mm. this shows like 
this appears to us like the Electoral Commission colluding with you know the new patriotic party to deliver the, the i mean the seat to them and for for which reason like you rightly said uh they have returned to the court to ensure that right. the electoral commission does not print the ballot papers um is, is it your um is it your position that perhaps the electoral commission will adhere to that do you think so oh, of course the, the ec is not above the law they ought to adhere to orders of the of uh, the court you're confident very confident Mm, Very confident that they will adhere to the orders of the court. I want us to you know, assess the Attorney General. Uh, we know that he's received two awards already as the, the best minister <laughs> uh, in 2021 and I think in 2022. Um, but that's a role that you have also occupied as a deputy before. Right. Uh, what's your assessment of the performance and conduct of the current Attorney General? Well, um, to be honest with you, I have always been very, very reluctant to second guess the work of the Attorney General. When he was a deputy, he was uh, someone who was occupying an office that I occupied previously. And it is usually not, I mean, a fair after you've left office for you to be, you know, kind of second guessing the decisions of your, your predecessor. And so I stayed away from commenting on his, uh, mm. you know, I mean, work as a deputy attorney general. And, but he said certain things publicly against me and against my uh, former boss, who was very remarkable, an excellent, you know, I mean, uh, attorney general by all standards, uh, given the work that she did. Um, she turned the attorney general into a corruption-free zone. And this was a report by the U.S. Uh, State Department itself, all right, then also, you know, she, you know, she was bold enough, you know, to take steps to prosecute persons who were, you know, appointees of our government and so on, which this, I mean, Attorney General will come to that, which he has not, I mean, uh, been able to do, okay? Um, but, you know, the Honorable Godfrey Dame was always on air comparing himself, his performance to the former Attorney General he once called the, the media, to say that he has bought 90 cars for the, I mean, the, the department, and that is a mark of his performance, and that's bet, better than we, we did. And, I mean, in government, we didn't buy as many cars in government. I mean, a government, for, for me, those were I mean, absolutely unnecessary comparisons, all right? Um, I don't know who gave him those awards, all right? Um, you know, these things, people you know, scheme to get record, public recognition all the time. So, I me, mean, I'm not a fan of, of, of awards. But let's so, talk about something you're a fan of. Yes. Has, has the department got better or has deteriorated compared to what you, you know? No, you I have no objective basis for saying that, to be honest with you, whether the department has gotten better um, or it has uh, deteriorated. I have no objective basis for saying that. Mm. I, I do speak to state attorneys who are not happy about certain happenings there, uh, but they, they speak to me in strict confidence, and I cannot divulge that, you know, publicly. Indeed, indeed. You know, but to be honest with you, I don't think that um, Godfrey Dame has done himself and the image of that office any good. You know, I mean, what he did with, uh, in the trial of Ato Forsen, yes. who should not have been, I mean, uh, instituted in the first place, mm -hmm. and then... Uh, um, you know, the fact that he interfered with witnesses, you know, that was very despicable. But was that interference you know? with witnesses yeah, it was, or, it, it, was or interference. it was plea bargaining, as he said? The plea bargaining aspect of it had completely been, you know, I mean, uh, 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 finished and the court, you know, was proceeding to trial when he started the interference because he just wanted to jail the Honorable Atu Forsen, by all means. Mm. All right. And I think that that is very despicable behavior. It was unethical. And in any decent society, he should have been in jail by now. Mm, yeah. I see. And, and he was also asked to resign. That didn't happen. He had said right. vehemently that he was not going to resign from right. that uh, you know, position as Attorney General. But also nothing has happened. Well, nothing will happen because his government is in power. And, so the, but, but the judiciary is still working. Well, the, I mean, the justice system no, is still the, going I mean, on. The, you, can't, you can't expect who is going, because if there are, if the things we are speaking about are, you know, I mean, ethical breaches, all right, you have to take them before the General Legal Council. Um, if also they are criminal, 
he is vested with prosecutorial, I mean, a power. So who is going to prosecute him? That, mm. that is where we are. Mm, I see. When we come back, we'll look at other issues, trending issues to do with the current administration. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My guest in this episode is Dr. Dominic Ayene. He's former Deputy Attorney General and Bogatanga East MP. We've been discussing a host of issues to do with the legal matters, particularly starting off with uh, the Supreme Court ruling that uh, overturns the Speaker's order in Parliament uh, this week. Uh, but now I want us to look at uh, issues of national growth, national development. There's only a few weeks now. We can right. talk about weeks now <clears throat> for, for the current government to wrap up and for whichever government to come in. You have been in the business of government for a long time right. now. Mm -hmm. What's your assessment of this administration as it wraps up? Um, you know, in 2017, when we, you know, um, came back from having lost the 2016 elections, I was, you know, thinking to myself, you know, because... The administration of which I was a part, the Mahama, the John Raman Mahama administration, had worked so hard, so hard, you know, um, for instance, to solve the Doomsaw crisis. Um, the economy, you know, was growing. Uh, infrastructure development was, you know, I mean, uh, um, everywhere to be, I mean, uh, to be seen, <clears throat> you know. Um, and as far as a, a part of that government, I was saddened by the fact that, you know, our progress had been cut short mm -hmm. as a, I mean, as a government by the electorate, all right? So I took the view that if the Nanado government, um, which had just started in 2017, um, would do half of the things that they promised Ghanaians, all right? then Ghana was going to be a paradise. And if Ghana was going to be a paradise, or, or let me say Ghana was going to leapfrog in its development, and if that was the case, all right, I was consoled by the fact that, you know, Ghanaians had chosen, you know, them to, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, um, you know, uh, to govern the country. Right. All right. It didn't take long before I started seeing signs that, okay, this was a 419 government, all right, that this was gross deception. No, okay. So? Yes. I mean, I mean, if you go back to my, my Facebook wall, as um, you know, early as um, I believe it must have been towards August of 2017, you know, I went on Facebook and I said, God is a card bearing member of the NDC, you know, because um, when His Excellency, Excellency John Ramani Mahama said, you know, posterity, I mean, a posterity mm -hmm. was going to judge him. All right. He was basically saying that, you know, the Lord Almighty, you know, was, you know, presiding in judgment over what, I mean, um, um, had happened, you know, to him after yeah. all the hard work that he had done. Okay. And we started seeing the signs. In 2017, we saw a lot of scandals, scandalous things, you know, already taking place. The boss, you know, dirty oil scandal and so many other things. And I, and you could see that they were not keeping to the promises that they had made to Ghanaians. Mm. Okay, that is what I meant by God is a card-bearing member of the NDC because God was on our side to reveal to us and to Ghanaians as a whole, okay, that they had put, they had, they had I mean, uh, taken, you know, I mean, uh, they had elected, okay, a government that they thought was competent, all right, Right. But which was grossly incompetent, mm. a government that they thought was, uh, you know, I mean, uh, um, not corrupt. Mm. Okay, but, but that but, was but it was, it was corrupt. going well. It was going well until COVID hit. No, 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 no. It was COVID, 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 COVID was COVID was was just, I mean, an opportunistic, you know, I mean, excuse that they use. Okay, um, because all the all the the, the scandals, all the, um, you know, the Let's, let's, I mean, uh, talk about the, um, for instance, the promises that they made, right? right? One village, one dam, you know, <clears throat> one um, uh, district, you know, one, uh, what do you call it? No, one district, one, one district, 
One district, one dam. No, one village, one dam. Yes, one okay. village, one dam. One, one district, district, one, one, mi million one million, dollars. and so on. Yes. One district, one ab ambulance, one uh, constituency, one million. You could just see, you know, from everything that was happening, that they were not, I mean, in, they did not intend, you know, to fulfill their promises. Mm. Okay, and you can see that the country has deteriorated, you know, in terms of its, its governance, mm. all right? Um, you know, major institutions of state have been bastardized. Very well. um, we, we, are, we are in a situation that, um, you know, is, is completely now, I mean, we are, we are in a situation that is completely deplorable. Indeed. You indeed. know, as far as, you know, the uh, governance of the country is concerned. Doc, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you very much indeed. for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Dominic Ayene is Bogatanga <laughs> East MP. He's also a former Deputy Attorney General. You can understand why uh, a chunk of our conversation has been on um, legal matters and things to do with the Supreme Court, is, you know, in the past week. Uh, this is Hot Issues. I'm Kemeni Amano. We hope to come your way again next week. Bye-bye.